Hi, John. Nice to meet you. How you doing? Yeah, good, good, good. Um, look, I was speaking to Michael yesterday. Yeah, look, I, I was just creating some some stuff about marketing attribution and measurement and it sort of blew up and then everyone's like, give me part three. And I'm like, uh, dude, I, I'm actually kind of like at the edges of my knowledge here. So, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, I kind of know how it works, but like I wouldn't be able to know how to discern the difference between a good MMM model and one that's just like, you know, uh, a charlatan in disguise, if you know what I mean. So a lot um, of people have that problem, unfortunately. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. But anyway, how are you? How's things going to recap? Things are good. Uh, we've got good traction. Um, I feel like we've got a really cool, good product. Timing is obviously right. This is a topic a lot of people are interested in. So all of that feels really good. Mm -hmm. Context, I've got a client in Sydney. Uh, they are actually installing um, Facebook's uh, Cappy, or, so Conversion API, you know, Robin, um, now and having some problems. So it's just funny because I'm in the thick of it right now and figuring out, oh, actually, trying to get these things like installed and configured is actually a lot harder. And these are like crazy engineers, right? It's um, really hard. I mean, we we love Robin because a lot of people try to get Robin going. They're like, this seems like a great idea. And then it like doesn't work. And they're like, oh man, now we need to go exactly like, what's happening. someone who really knows what they're doing. And that's then they come yeah. up. Um, basically, um, I'm introducing the, the sort of political nature of measurement, number one, as, as, as at the start of the, the deck. Um, then it goes into models. I'm like, what is a model, right, first? And, you know, a model is just like a, a representation of reality using generally statistics or sort of mathematical means, right, to do so. And making sense of, like, lots of different inputs and, and modeling reality. Um, is that correct or, or not? Uh, that is a very high level and abstract way of, uh, I think, describing what a model is. So no fundamental objections there. And I find with MMM, there's two sort of branches. One is very media mix or advertising mix modeling. The other one is a bit more comprehensive in terms of the rest of the marketing mix, uh, pricing, distribution, competition, saturation, a lot of ex external sort of factors. Would, is that accurate or not? That's one, that's one way to talk about it. Um, that's a little bit more of like sort of the old school way of thinking about it, you know, because if you think about a lot of modern brands, like pricing distribution are not really things, right? Like if you're selling on Amazon, it's not like you're counting up the number of bodegas that are selling Pepsi, right? And like, you know, there's not, in general, there's like a national price. And so that's also less of a thing. It's not like, oh, we're running discounts in these certain regions and not in these, like that is just not really a variable for, Again, a lot of brands, um, if you're, you know, a major CPG rate retailer, then that is more important. Um, but for a lot of brands, those things just aren't really a thing at all. And so that style of media mix modeling, I think, is a little bit less relevant for a lot of the brands that are operating today and a lot of the way that marketing works today. Most of what people, like, I believe, are doing today is just like really focused on the media and less on some of the pricing and distribution things. Again, that varies a little bit. Some of the big CPG companies are still more focused on like, you know, pricing and relative price compared to competitors. Um, but a lot of like newer brands are not in that situation. Yeah. And then, um, but one big change, just correct me if I'm wrong here, is that MMM used to be kind of clunky, like like these guys used to do it, like for tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, and now it's like, what, you can just sort of apply something in, in, a, in a web browser or a piece of software and shove it in? Maybe. I mean, this is, a, this is, the, this is the part where like your sort of initial definition of a model becomes really important. An MMM or a model in general is only as good as its assumptions match onto the question that you're trying to answer. You can do really simple models that are technically MMMs, uh, but the problem is often that those the assumptions of those very simple models do not map onto the real world very well, and therefore they generate uh, yeah. In an accurate representation of, yeah, 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 I know. It's as good as like how you can figure a piece of software to use for whatever, really. Exactly. You know, like, it's like you can either buy the software, or you can buy the the outcome of the software. The the big issue with MMM is that all of the off the shelf tools, I believe, do not actually have a good mapping between the assumption that the model is making in the real world, and therefore. They generally lead to pretty crazy results that are incorrect and do not make sense. Um, that is sort of the fundamental problem of media mix modeling in most situations and how it has mostly been done historically. Yeah. What are some examples of that? So Robin, Google Lightweight MMM, every other off-the-shelf tool, mo what most consultants do, 
make a fundamental assumption that over the time period being analyzed, the marketing, the like the ROI of a channel is fixed and doesn't change. Over the last okay. two years, Facebook has had an ROI of 3.4, they will tell you. That doesn't make sense. No marketer believes that that is true, right? No marketer believes that like one channel has a consistent ROI over a long time period. All of those models make that assumption. And so to the extent that like the underlying truth varies from that assumption to the extent that there actually are changes in that underlying ROI, the model will potentially not fit well. That's sort of like the best case scenario because then at least you know that it's wrong or yeah. the model will think that it fits well, but will just give you bad answers. And it's very difficult as a marketer to know which of those, to, to know if that's the case. And so what you'll see is that like, there are a lot of sort of ways to do MMM out in the world. Like you can do it in a Google sheet, you can run a regression, but those are not very sophisticated. They don't map, they don't match on to like the way the world actually works. You can use more sophisticated tools like Robin, still not sophisticated enough because it still doesn't map onto the way the world works. And what we've seen in practice is that people who use Robin end up not actioning off of it because they don't believe the results are accurate because the results aren't actually accurate because of all of these underlying fundamental problems. And so the real, I think, pro the real trick to media mix modeling is that you need to have a really good model that actually maps onto the way that you believe the world works and the way that it works for your business. And the further that gap is between the assumption the models are making and the like the way that your business works, the way that you believe that marketing works for your business, the bigger that gap is, the worse the model results are going to be. And MMM is okay. especially pernicious because it's very difficult to know if the model results are accurate or not. Because like some people will be like, oh, look, there's like a really good R squared or like the accuracy is really good. But like that doesn't actually tell you if the inferences themselves are good which is like, what are the results, what are the results that you care about of the model? Cause you're not doing a prediction exercise. You're not trying to predict revenue. That's actually a much easier problem than, than MMM. And so those are where people actually end up running into problems as they're trying to put this into practice at their businesses. Okay, this is kind of my hypothesis before I talk to you. I'm like, I'm sure this is the case because this is also my experience uh, with this. I tried to implement uh, like a Markov model for uh, a startup when I was in an SF um, back in 2017, before any of this was like Vogue, you know what I mean? Um, before iOS 14, obviously. Um, but they were very much in this fixed like cause and effect digital attribution mindset. And obviously that is, that's changed. Um, I'm, I'm sure you've seen that. Hence the, the new appetite for, for this kind of side of measurement. Um, okay. So problem is implementation. Um, problem is people judging the accuracy of the model. Um, is it a set and forget thing? Like how crazy is the implementation of a model that reflects reality? Like, do you need to do a lot of groundwork? Does it need to be sort of tweaked over time to get the most out of it? I mean, you know, yeah. the model's only as good as the first time it's proven incorrect, yeah? Yeah, so this is, this is again, like I can, you know, recast, at recast, we are taking a really like direct approach to trying to solve these problems. So what we do is very different than what like everyone else does. So for everyone else, I think, you know, big problems are, requires a lot of tweaking for any off the shelf tool to make the model accurate for your business. And in some cases, in many cases, that's not even possible at all, given the fundamental underlying assumptions that can't be changed with some off the shelf tool. Then it's like, okay, what do we do with this? Well, you need to go figure out how to go and validate it. You in general want to do that with some sort of test, right? So you want to like, look at this and be like, oh, it says TikTok's really good. We're going to like spend a ton into TikTok and hopefully see a bunch of new revenue. And if we don't, then we know that it wasn't accurate. Or you want to go run a like a geography holdout test. And like we're going to run a bunch of search ads only in this region and not in this other one. And then look at the difference. So like that sort of way of validating it. Yeah. And then as the world changes, right? Like TikTok for a lot of companies right now has been really good, but that's in part because I think there aren't that many advertisers on TikTok in like three months, the big advertisers are going to be on TikTok, CPMs are going to go up, performance is going to go down. And so the question is like, okay, you built this model in the world where TikTok was good. How do you need now to change it in this new world? And that again is like a sort of thing where like someone needs to be paying attention to it and thinking about it in order to be able to make sure that the model is updating and reflecting the new state yep. of the world. And then potentially you can run another test, validate it again and do all of this, do this whole process over and over again. You need to hire a data scientist. 
at least one. And this is the thing that's really tricky is that like, again, so a lot of data scientists are really good at like machine learning, right? And that's where they've cut their teeth. Um, they know the machine learning tool set. Media mix modeling is not a machine learning model. And so data scientists that are good at machine learning often really struggle with media mix modeling because it's not the same type of problem. And so this is a really tricky thing where like you potentially need to go hire like a statistician, right? Like someone who like really knows statistics really well. Metrics, basically. Like an econometrician, right? Econometrics is the right thing. And that's yeah. not how a lot of data scientists today have been trained. Uh, ML. So um, there's a lot of these people, um, Mike sort of maybe mentioned this, that they, they take you know, Robin or some kind of open source uh, MMM sort of model, they wrap it up, they layer on some AI, uh, repackage it up and sell it as, as a tool, right? Um, so you're saying that putting ML or AI on top as a badge is kind of meaningless in this regard. It's very meaningless in this regard. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, I mean, again, like it depends a little bit, right? Like exactly how they're doing it. Um, but often like ML, tends to be really good at like prediction type problems. You know, it's like in chess, like what's the next best move to make? What are, move are they going to do after that? And then what would we do after that? Like that's Based sort of on thing. retrospective learning, right? Right, yeah. but it's, but the goal is to predict, right? The goal yeah. is to predict. The goal, you know, is to like predict, is this customer when they land on your website, are they going to convert or not? And then we're going to do something. And there's a whole bunch of tools that are built for doing that, but they're all built around this idea of, is this set of parameters better at predicting than this other set of parameters? And that's yeah. like the, what they're very focused on. The MMM world, that's not what we're trying to do. What we're trying to do is we're trying to know if I were to make a change to the amount of Facebook spend, then what would happen? Which is sort of a prediction problem, but it's not the same type of prediction problem of someone lands on a page and are they likely to convert or not? And yeah. so... A lot of the people who are like, oh, we'll just use ML for doing the uh, MMM thing, they aren't thinking really hard about the inference problem, like the, the underlying econometrics. And they're really just like, oh yeah, we'll make it so that it predicts really well. But the models that predict the best are often not like, at Recast, we talk about this all the time, like we could make a model that predicts revenue much better than the model that we currently use. It would be trivial. Like it would not be hard at all to do. We would just use some off the shelf machine learning model and it would do, have more predictive accuracy. Unfortunately, it would not give us correct inferences, which are the things that we actually care about solving for. And where inferences are the thing of, if we were to spend an extra thousand dollars on Facebook, how many additional customers would we drive? ML is really good at like picking up correlations right? That's what it's designed to do is it's designed to find correlations. The ML model doesn't care if it's causation or correlation, right? Because it's like, oh, well, there's something here, right? It might be correlated with the true cause or it might be the true cause itself. The ML model doesn't care. But for an, an MMM, we care if it's correlation or causation. And so yeah. that's like the thing that a lot of people who are like, oh yeah, we'll just, you know, pick the version of Robin that is has the best prediction, it's like, that's not actually solving the right problem. And so that's where my skepticism towards a lot of those approaches comes from. Okay, that's the same same as myself. Um, the other thing uh, I just have to mention um, is inventory. So if we're doing media inventory, I know this for a fact, you know, if you go and follow Facebook or Google's um, default kind of suggestions uh, and placements, et cetera, they're gonna sell you a lot of this sort of cheap junk inventory, which doesn't really have an effect on the sales, right? But it racks up really nice reach figures or impressions. So um, the danger here I find, and the same happens with offline media, by the way, if you're not careful about how you you spend, um, yeah, because everyone wants to offload the, the highest profit margin inventory, right? Is that if you're then creating a model based on like a reach metric or something and looking for uplifts, like you're then just, your model is based on shitty inventory, you know, in the mix. So is cleaning up and being really clear about the data sources coming in, the integrity of that data to start with, really critical to- It is really the critical. Accuracy? It okay. is really critical. I mean, at recast, like we don't, judgment call though. we don't use any like impression or reach metrics for exactly that reason. Like it's because it changes over time even within a platform, exactly for the way that you described. It's different across platforms. So like the reach for Facebook doesn't mean the same thing as like your reach for like a podcast ad. And so like once you're trying to like compare those two, you're all of a sudden using different variables that are defined very differently. And so like we don't do any of that. There are modelers, I, I think some modelers can like make an argument is to some certain situations where you can do that, but it requires being very careful and very thoughtful about it for exactly the reason you're describing. Like, is this reach metric measuring the thing that we care about 
or not? And then how, like, what role is it playing in the model and in our interpretation of it? And is that going to lead us to good decisions? Those sorts of questions are really like deep questions from like a statistical perspective and from like a product usage perspective. And I think a lot yeah, of media perspective and a media and like a marketing perspective. And a lot of modelers, I don't think fully make that connection. And that's a place where people really can go wrong. Yeah. And so, so, um, okay. Then question to you, what is the better sort of metrics if you had to give a broad remit, um, instead of reaching impressions that we should be using? Behavioral I mean, I think actions, people really want to, I think, you know, you really want to focus on the things that marketers control and that like map onto the bottom line, which is like spend. And so that's what I, we generally encourage most people to focus on is focus on marketing spend as the variables that you're measuring. Cause those are the things that actually matter and that you can actually control. And so that requires less translation when you're thinking about interpreting the results. Um, and then you want to focus on the relationship between spend and then the outcome variable that it actually moves the needle for the business. Again, like driving traffic to the website is probably not the right thing because that's, you can drive a lot of low quality traffic very easily as every marketer knows. And so you want to focus on the conversions, the things that are like closer to the conversion event so that you're not going to get led astray by those sorts of other problems. Okay, so then um, to go a deep, bit deeper again, this kind of be my last question. Um, uh, there is a lot of marketers who, and, and science around memories, right? And memories being this latent purchase trigger. And um, it's all about sort of mental availability, i.e. the brand coming to mind at the time of a purchase decision. And that is inherently sort of an intangible construct that lives inside people's brains. So then there's a lot of um, brand tracking studies and et cetera that use sort of MMM modeling to an extent to then track you know, what is that recall? Uh, is it uh, sort of top of mind or is it aided recall? And then sort of use that as a generic barometer for then sales. But obviously there's a big leap between knowing the brand, knowing the brand that exists in a category and then it coming to mind and being preferenced in a purchase. So though that step between just brand awareness and purchase intent at the time of purchase is a big leap. It's a big uh, what leap. Do you, <laughs> yeah, what would you say to that? Because a lot of the ad world is all about brand awareness. You know, brand I, mean, awareness, brand I think awareness. brand awareness is a valuable thing to measure. I think that there is value to having brand awareness. It's better if more people are aware of your brand than not. Um, I think the way brand awareness is measured makes it very difficult to do really sophisticated analyses on it. Because in general, it's a survey, you know, once a month, right? Is like the max I've ever seen someone run one of these surveys. And so your data are very thin. And, to, and, and often these surveys are very noisy because they're very expensive, right? So you're interviewing like 500 people max. And so your confidence bounds on like how much awareness you have is quite wide. And so it's very, very difficult to be able to like say, okay, we spent this amount of money. It drove some change in brand awareness that was outside of that, that uncertainty bound. That's very hard to do just period for any brand within that short amount of time. And then, as you said, be able to make that connection to like purchases that are happening is also like very tough to do. So I think, you know, in general, it's a good thing that you, to keep an eye on. I do think it's a good thing to measure brand awareness that you know, like, are we gaining brand awareness? But I think it's very hard to bring that into a like rigorous performance marketing uh, type of orientation because of all of those like measurement problems and the difficulty to draw the line between changes to brand awareness and changes to uh, either media spend on one side or com or purchases on the other. Okay, great. Um, okay, I think that's a really good overview. Um, thanks, for, thanks for your time. Um, a lot of firms are at very different levels of maturity. So the way I'm writing the guide is like, okay, this is kind of where you might be, you know, looking at Google Analytics and then you go to MTA and tagging stuff and then you're kind of moving up to more of a model and yeah. you know it gets more complex and it's like um i'm trying to orientate people around okay well where are you here how can you improve from where you are if you want to um, that's exactly how we what mistakes are you making yeah. yeah that's and that's exactly how we framed it and so i think that that's exactly right and i think you know it's not like a it's not a graduation right like it really is like a building upon it so like when even when we're working with companies at recast we're not like look you're not going to throw away your Google Analytics report, you're not going to throw away your last touch reporting, you're not going to stop, you're not going to like stop doing experiments, right? You're going to like use all of these things, then you're going to add modeling on top as an additional layer through which to view it. And I think that that's like, that makes a lot of sense and is really the right way to think about it in terms of like progressing in terms of um, sophistication and how you're going to get value out of this, out of these different types of tools.